Hello, lovers of God. Welcome to Monday Night Bible. I'm Alan Hunt. Whether you're watching live or whether you're watching the replay, I'm really, really glad you're here. Tonight, the question, how do you get ready for Christmas? And we're going to answer that with the one thing that Scripture says is the single best way to get ready for Christmas, the single most important way to get ready for Christmas. And I suspect it might surprise you a little bit how to get ready for Christmas. So we'll jump into tonight's um, gospel reading, which comes from Luke chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. It's this coming Sunday's Mass reading for, for, for the gospel. Luke 3, verses 1 through 6. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So that's this Sunday's Gospel reading. And there's two things I want you to notice about this Gospel reading for this Sunday. The first one's a little small thing, but it's important to me just because I love Scripture so much. I want you to notice how much history Luke packs into his Gospel. Luke was a historian more than the other gospel writers were, more than Matthew, more than Mark, more than John. John was interested in philosophy, Matthew much more in the in the teaching of Jesus, and um, Mark was interested in a very short, concise presentation of the gospel and of the cross. But Luke has the characteristics of a Roman historian, much more like you and I would write history than like people in the ancient Greco-Roman world would write history. Notice what he says here. Uh, in the beginning of Luke chapter 3, in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee. See all the details that he's given us? I, I just think that's interesting. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that tonight. just want you to notice that if you're looking for a more modern historical account, Luke is probably your guy. He's probably your gospel. Look at all those details that he gives you of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Pontius Pilate was governor. Herod was tetrarch. Philip was tetrarch. Uh, Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas were, were the high priest, and the word of God comes to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness. So he sets the stage for the, for the gospel, and he sets the stage for what John the Baptist, um, who is the son of Zechariah, does. Because if you think, one last point on that history thing, is that if you go back to the very beginning of the gospel of Luke, the way that he starts his gospel is with one very, very long sentence. Notice what he says. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the things which have been accomplished among us, just as they were delivered to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. So he's, he's saying a lot of people have written an account of what happened with Jesus. A lot of that came from eyewitnesses and people who are ministers of the word. So people who know what they're talking about. Then in verse three, still in that same sentence from Luke to start his gospel. This is Luke chapter one, verses one to four. Luke says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you have been informed. So notice, he starts off his gospel, his gospel by saying, remember, everybody else starts with something about Jesus. Luke starts with a lot of people written stuff down, a lot of people who, who are eyewitnesses, a lot of people who know what they're talking about. I'm going to go back and put all that together and give you an orderly account. And notice who he addresses it to there at the end of verse 3, Theophilus. Theophilus, Theo, God, Phyllis, lover, lover of God. For you, most excellent lover of God. So he's writing this for lovers of God like you and me, that you may know the truth concerning the things of which you've been informed. So Luke's bringing that historical um, account to, to the task of writing his gospel. Now, Back to this Sunday's gospel. That was just an Alan Hunt thing because I dig scripture and, and wanted you to have that little insight into Luke. Here's the focus for tonight. Here's the way to get ready for Christmas. As we move into Advent, the season leading up to Christmas, 
and we're preparing for the coming of Jesus into the world, notice what Luke says. The word of God came to John, it's John the Baptist, John the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So the first thing I wanted you to notice was, notice how historical Luke is. But the main thing I want you to see tonight is what he says is the primary emphasis of what John the Baptist says in terms of getting ready for Jesus. How should you and I get ready for Christmas? Repentance. In fact, we're going to see, I'm going to share with you four different places in the Gospel of Luke where it's clear. It's clear that this theme of repentance is so crucially important, not only to John the Baptist, not only to getting ready for Christmas, not only to Advent, but for the very, very core message of what Jesus is talking about. Repentance. In Luke 5, And the Pharisees and their scribes murmured against his disciples, this is Jesus, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So Jesus is making it clear. This is only in Luke 5, very early in, in, in his ministry. People, are, The religious people are criticizing him for hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Why don't you hang out with us? Why don't you hang out with us religious authorities? Why don't you hang out with us religious leaders? Why don't you hang out with us people who know what we're talking about? And Jesus says, I didn't come for the, for the, for the people who are well. I came for people who are sick. I came to call sinners to repentance. Second time it comes up, Jesus says in Luke 13, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So again, he's calling us to repent. So if we're going to prepare for Jesus, if we're going to prepare for the coming of Jesus at Christmas, if we're going to prepare to meet Jesus, this word repentance is going to be really important. And we're going to get to that in just a second by what he means by that. But I want to show you the, whoops, I want to show you the third, the third time that Jesus says this. This is a really famous passage that you're very familiar with. Now the tax collectors and sinners from Luke 15 were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. See that, th see that theme coming again? The religious leaders are criticizing Jesus for who he hangs out with. He doesn't hang out with all the, the, the prim and proper church people. Verse 3, so Jesus told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more, and more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So notice, the Pharisees criticized Jesus for hanging out with sinners. Jesus says, what man of you, if you have a hundred sheep, you get up in the morning, you count your sheep, and you see that there's only 99 there. Notice what he says there in verse 4. He leaves the 99 in the wilderness. He doesn't, get, he doesn't get a friend to come take care of the 99. He doesn't put them in a pen. He leaves them in the wilderness. He leaves them at risk to go find the one which is lost. He's saying, you're criticizing me for hanging out with sinners. And what I'm saying is, I'm going out to find the one who was lost. And then in verse 7, I tell you there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So Jesus goes to seek and to find and to save that which is lost. And then one last time, the fourth time in the Gospel of Luke, this time in verse 19. I mean, chapter 19, I'm sorry. Jesus entered Jericho. I get excited. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. And there was a man named Zacchaeus. You're probably familiar with this story too, right? He was a chief tax collector and rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but couldn't on account of the crowd because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, he's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. So again, the religious leaders for the third time are criticizing Jesus for who he hangs out, who, who he hangs out with. Tax collectors and sinners, people who are known to be sinful. Jesus spends his time with the sinful. 
And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus is making it clear for us. He hangs around sinners. He takes criticism from the religious authorities and the religious leaders for not hanging around them, but for hanging around sinners. Because he comes to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus enters the world. This is what's coming for Advent. Christmas is our celebration of Jesus coming into the world to seek and to save that which is lost. Those of us who are sick, not those who are well, those who are spiritually sick, those who are the lost sheep, people like you and me. This is really good news. Jesus came to save the sinners and the lost. That's you and me. That's what's so wonderful about Christmas, is that God is stepping into the world. Jesus is becoming flesh. He's emptying himself of his place in heaven and coming and being born in that humble manger. And so we want to get ready for that because he's coming not for those who are already healthy, but for people like you and me, the sinners and the lost, people who are spiritually in need. This is good news. So Christmas is about God entering the world for you and me. And so as you and I get ready for Christmas, what's the one single best thing that you and I can do in Advent? Repent. Repent. What does repent mean? Well, if you look it up, here's some of the definitions for you. To turn around. To feel sorrow for sin. To change your mind. A complete turning around. So think about you're driving one way, and you stop, and you turn, and you go the other way. It's a complete turning around. It's a metanoia, a change of your mind. I was thinking one way, and I realized I was wrong, and so I changed my mind. It's to feel sorrow for sin. So repentance is a turning around, so it involves some behavior. It's a changing my mind. It's a change of mindset, and it involves some sorrow, some regret. To repent is to feel sorry, to change my mind, and then to turn around. So the way that we would think about this for Advent is I'm going to stop moving my way. I'm going to stop driving on Alan's way. I'm going to turn around. I'm going to change my mind. I'm going to express remorse, and I'm going to go God's way. And so this is a really great gospel reading for us as Advent begins because you and I know that once we hit the speed bump of Thanksgiving— we don't even, we don't even, we barely slow down. There's not a red light at Thanksgiving. It's just a speed bump, right? We just kind of bump over and we're headed straight into Christmas. We just bump slow for just a second and then we're headed straight into the month of December and boom, Advent and the frenzy of Christmas just overwhelms us. And so this is a great gospel reading because it causes us to stop and say, Jesus says the most important thing, and John the Baptist says the most important thing that you and I can do to get ready for Christmas is to repent, to stop moving my way, express remorse, change my mind, and start moving God's way. In other words, focus on what matters most and what matters least. Because my way matters the least, and God's way matters the most. And so this is a great time for you and me to take a deep breath as Advent begins, as December 1 hits us on the calendar, and say, all right, what really matters most in my life? What does God really want from my life? What does God really want from me? And how have I not been doing that? Because I've been focused on my own stuff and what matters least. I've been focused on all the little minutia and the little details of life that may not be that important, the leaves in my yard taking care of my car, all that little stuff that just seems to take up so much of my time. What matters most? That's what repentance does. That's why this is at the beginning of uh, of Advent. That's why John the Baptist is calling us to repent, because it brings clarity what matters most. God is coming into the world to seek and to save the lost. That's me. That's you. It brings clarity. It brings awareness. And repentance brings humility. That's, I think, the key word that I want us to really zero in on. Repentance brings humility. It means I was wrong. 
means I've been focused on the wrong things. I've been focused on my way instead of God's way. I need to change my mind. I need to change my direction. I need to turn around. I need to express regret and sorrow for my sin. And so a lot of times when we think about repentance, we think about going to confession, and that's a great thing. I love, I love the sacrament of confession, the sacrament of reconciliation. It's a wonderful thing. Healing, powerful, significant. But I want to give you a different way of looking at your repentance tonight. As you think about the beginning of Advent, as you think about the month of December that lies ahead of you, all the days that lead up to Christmas and all the frenzy that can overwhelm us with trying to purchase gifts and with trying to wrap gifts and trying to plan to go see friends and plan to go to this party and making sure I get my Christmas cards out and decorating my tree and all those things. As I think about those things, how do I really focus on what matters most? Here's one way to do that. Here's one way to repent. Do some things that really humble you. For example, serve someone who really needs help. Maybe you have a neighbor who struggles to, to get her groceries. Maybe you make a trip to the grocery for her. Maybe you have a friend who's really down in the dumps and feeling the heaviness of the world right now because his brother just passed away. Maybe you go spend some time with him and carve out that time and give him the gift of your presence, your full undivided attention and attentive ear. And maybe you find a way to serve somebody you don't like. Maybe you have a coworker that you just really don't like being around. Or maybe you have a family member who's like that. Just they get on your last nerve. They just jump on that last nerve and just drive you batty. And so you try to avoid them. Maybe a way to repent and maybe a way to really experience humility in your life is to find a way to serve them. Maybe to go take care of their yard because you know they're overwhelmed and too busy. Maybe to pick up some of their job at work because you just want to give them that gift. Serve someone you don't like, or just serve. Maybe you find some time to go help build a Habitat house. Maybe you find some time to, to serve by going and, and helping at Salvation Army as they get overwhelmed with people who are dropping off stuff at this time of year, or just to go ring the bell in front of Walmart or in front of, uh, of Target just to, to, to serve. To give yourself away so that you're selfless. That leads to a humility and it leads to repentance. It leads to a changing of your mind and it leads to turning around from my way and going God's way. What matters most versus what matters least. One way that, that um, I, I think about this is we're coming up on the anniversary here pretty soon of my, of my dad's death. It's been almost 20 years, hard for me to believe. He died uh, far too young. He was only 75, prostate cancer. And I was really, really lucky because in his last week or two of life, uh, my brother and I, there's only two of us, and my mom, I come from a very small family. Uh, my dad was in the hospital in Lakeland, Florida, at Lakeland Regional Medical Center. And so my brother and I both left where, where we were. My brother's in North Carolina. I'm in Georgia. And we went down to, to Lakeland to be with my dad in the last weeks of his life. And for the last few days of his life, he was in the hospital, bedridden. And he was still lucid most of the time, but he slept a lot. And so he wasn't always awake and he wasn't always conscious. Um, but when he was awake, he was he was pretty much with you. It wasn't like he was uh, living in some other time and space or, or having um, visions or, or delusions or things. And I remember being with him, oh, a day or two before he died. And... It was just me in the room, and, and I looked at my dad, and, and, and he had a lot of stubble on his face. He hadn't shaved in, in, in a while. And it just occurred to me, I thought, you know, my dad actually brought, he was very fastidious. I love that word, fastidious. He's very fastidious about, about shaving, and he, had his, he brought his shaving kit to the hospital, even though I suspect he knew he was getting ready to die. Still, he had that shaving kit with his, with his brush and his, and his foam and his, and his, and his razor. And I thought back to one of the things when I first started to shave as a kid, my dad said to me, you know, Alan, um, when I get up in the morning, if I don't shave first thing, my day just doesn't go right. Something about shaving just makes me feel clean. It makes me feel sharp. It makes me alert. It gives me, it kind of energizes me. I, if I don't shave, my day is not so great. And so I realized that my dad, who's in the hospital, he's getting ready to die. He's got his shaving kit there. He hadn't shaved in several days. 
I said, Dad, would you like me to shave you? And he very weakly said, yeah, that'd be great. So I took out his shaving kit and I put the soap and the foam on his face and I very gently tried to shave him as best I could. Didn't do a great job, but did what I could. And when I got done, I was kind of cleaning up his face and he said, Alan, my, uh, my fingernails and my toenails are driving me crazy. Um, he's like me. And that I, I like to keep my nails really, really short. This gets on my nerves when they're not. He said, would you, would you clip my nails for me? And I said, sure. So I, I took a little time and I clipped his, his fingernails and then I took his feet and I clipped his toenails. And I said, dad, you know, I love you. And I didn't think that much about it, but it was this time of year. It was, it was Advent. And it occurred to me after my dad died a day or two later, that in a way I was giving him that gift just of my attention and my care for one of the things that was important to him in this world. But in a way it was during Advent, I was preparing my dad to see the King. I was preparing my dad to meet the King. As Advent reminds us that Jesus comes into the world to save us, to find us, to meet us on our own terms. And that when we pass, we go to him. And that in that season of Advent, almost 20 years ago, as I helped my dad get clean and feel fresh, alert and ready, ready to die ready to cross into the next life. I was giving him that gift of Advent of preparing to meet the King. And in some ways, I guess that was very helpful to me because if you know me very well, you know that I am not an expert on humility. <laughs> Ooh, I'm anything but that. But it gave me some humility just to be able to serve my dad and to shave him and to clip his nails like that. It helped me to repent, to focus on what mattered most, loving my dad, helping him feel clean and ready to meet the king instead of what matters least, like all the things that were probably on my to-do list and the voicemails I had on my phone and the emails that I had waiting for me. Who cares? It's just stuff. And so that simple act of service helped me to repent and to gain some clarity and to focus on what matters most rather than what matters least. St. Bernard of Clairvaux, love that guy, said the three most important parts of your spiritual life are humility, humility, and humility. So this gospel reading for Sunday, when John the Baptist tells us to repent and Jesus all the way through the gospel of Luke tells us to repent, to focus on what matters most, to let go of what matters least, to have a change of mind, to have a change of, of direction from my way to God's way. The goal was to remember who we really are, to have humility, to have the right sense of who I really am as I stand before God. As Jesus comes into the world to remember, I am not God, he is. Humility repentance. That's the single greatest thing, the single most important thing that you and I can do to get ready for Christmas. Because as St. Bernard Clairvaux said, when God forgives a sinner who humbly confesses his sin, the devil loses his dominion over the heart he had taken. So when we come to God with humility, with repentance, the devil loses his power and God welcomes us into him. So the two questions for you as we wrap Monday Night Bible tonight, if you're watching together as a group, I invite you to, to discuss this as a group and to learn from each other and to inspire each other and encourage each other. If you're watching this on your own, I invite you to journal a little bit. Number one, have you ever served someone when you didn't want to or served someone you didn't like? What was that like? Bring that experience to mind. Relive it just a little bit. Serving somebody when you didn't want to serve or serving someone that you didn't like. Remember what was what was that like? Did it bring humility? Did it bring some clarity? Did it bring some self-awareness? And then the second thing, have you ever served someone and afterwards sensed the presence of God? 
Have there been times when you served in any setting, serving children, serving someone in need, serving the poor, serving your neighbor, serving your mother, and afterward you sensed the presence of God? Think about those two questions as you think about this passage from John the Baptist in the Gospel of Luke, as he brings the message of repentance as we move into Advent and we prepare for Christmas, as Jesus comes into the world, what's the single best thing, the single most important thing, the most powerful thing that you and I can do to get ready for Christmas? Repent. Repent. I pray you have a great week. God bless you. And as we close tonight, let me pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we love you so. And as we prepare for you to come into the world, On Christmas Day, help us to repent, to have a change of mind, a change of heart, a change of direction, and a sorrow for sin, that we might gain a humility and welcome you with open arms. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Faith, hope, and love.